had a, few, a couple mishaps. Uh, so welcome, though. In the meantime, welcome to uh, the new perspectives. We are starting today uh, a new eight-part series on the coming of the subjective age. And uh, you'll see on our website, if you go to lagrasse.com, uh, that this eight-part series includes uh, various topics on the subjective age, anywhere from uh, bhakti in the subjective age to education, to the transition from the individualist to the subjective age, et cetera. So we've got a total of about 10 different speakers. And once you sign up for one, if you're here today, you will automatically receive uh, Zoom invites for the rest. So you only have to uh, sign up for one. So again, welcome to the coming of the subjective age. And uh, Sri Obindo explains in his theory of human cycle, that it is the evolution of consciousness that is responsible for the progression of both the individual and the collective, and that this progression at the collective level occurs in the cyclical fashion. So far, human society has passed through the symbolic, typal, and conventional age. The present is the age of individualism and reason. However, we are in an important period of transition from this age of individualism to the subjective age. And as a result, humanity has begun to understand that there is a need to seek intuitional knowledge and ga gain a deeper self-awareness. So today, uh, Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko will kick off this series and discuss Sri Aurobindo's stages of social development in the human cycle and compare these stages to Gebser's social philosophy on the structures of consciousness. He will also relate the ancient Indian system of the four yugas to the cycles of social development. You all probably know Vladimir by now, but I'll do a brief uh, uh, background. Um, he holds a master's degree in general and theoretical linguistics and in Sanskrit language and literature, as well as a PhD in Indian philosophy. He is a scholar and instructor of Sanskrit and an educator and research in Vedic and Vedantic studies. And Vladimir, of course, is here in Fountain Inn. He is the director of our Institute for Applied Research and Integral Studies. Um, so today, if you have uh, any comments or questions that you would like to make that uh, Vladimir will get to towards the end of the session, if you can just raise your hand and, uh, and then we'll bring you over to ask your questions. So instead of using the Q&A box or the chat, just raise your hand and towards the end, we'll bring you over to, uh, to ask uh, the question or make your comment. So without further ado, uh, Vladimir, let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Radha. Uh, in case uh, somebody doesn't want to show up and ask the question, you can leave it in the uh, Q&A box or comments also. So that's fine also. So both can be used by us. Um, yes, today we begin the new uh, series on, on the vision of the coming of the subjective age. There is the whole chapter in the human cycle by Sri Aurobindo, which is called the coming of the subjective age. Um, by the way, I must say that we created the whole audio book, which is very useful for those who want to study the human cycle. So the whole human cycle is recorded and you can read in the same time, listen to the to the uh, readings by Narad, which is well done. So you could learn this um, profound uh, work of Sri Aurobindo on psychology of social development. So um, I prepared a small uh, PowerPoint presentation, which will be also attached for your perusal later, but um, here I will project it now. In, so, um, so I will be making this introduction for the sake of um, creating a background for the further studies, because there will be much more said in the in the next presentation. So I will not cover the whole range, but I want to create a background and the 
major understanding of how and why Sri Aurobindo calls his work the human cycle, why it is developing in cycles. And what was uh, fundamentally misunderstood by Indian philosophers and Western philosophers in general. Mm, and uh, so uh, if we look at these uh, paradigm shifts, which I will be mentioning today, uh, there will be several of them. The ancient Indian system, Sri Aurobindo's system of psychology of social development, Gapser's system of his uh, the uh, ever-present origin work, and the even Marxist theory. We will look into all of these if we have enough time and uh, analyze this cyclic development. So the cyclic development comes actually from the Indian, ancient Indian system of yugas, of kalpas, manvantaras, and yugas. So if we look at this uh, system, we will see uh, that uh, it is always uh, seen as fourfold. This fourfold development is uh, taken into many different frameworks. First of all, each manvantara, there are 14 manvantaras in one kalpa, this is a huge period of time, has mahayugas, four mahayugas. And these four mahayugas are split into smaller yugas. And these yugas are satya, treta, dvapara, and kali yuga. Uh, Satya Yuga is the most uh, profound, the most uh, harmonious, uh, the most open to the influence of the spirit, and Kali Yuga is just the opposite, narrowed down to the individual. So through, from the most uh, social and the most uh, general communal consciousness to the most individual, the development is taking place. So we can see also that Shruti literature, the literature of the um, revelation of Indian uh, knowledge has also four parts. Some Hita texts, which belong most probably to the, um, to the beginning, or Satya Yuga, Brahmana, Saranyakas, and Upanishads, four types which are also moving from the most revelatory text and into it to, towards intuition and finally towards the rational philosophy. There are four ashramas, Brahmacharin, Grihastha, Vanaprastha and Sanyasin, also narrowing down the whole project of studies within the individual life framework. And um, there are four Varnas. There are Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. You can see the same, main, uh, the same way of thinking. Four parts of universal Purusha, mouth, hands, thighs, and legs. And four Mahashaktis, Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, and Mahasaraswati. This is quite amazing because uh, basically they follow the same intuitional knowledge or archetypal knowledge which builds up the whole understanding of society and individual we can add to this also the individual's life we have childhood we have uh, uh, adulthood we have uh, youth the adulthood and finally we have the old age so these are also the four parts or four seasons starting with spring, autumn, spring, summer, autumn and winter. So this cyclic development is um, the way how nature manages and arranges the whole movement forward. So it does it in cycles. The same happens in, um, in uh, uh, human society. So in the Veda, this um, anthropomorphic character of society is beautifully uh, projected or presented by the Purusha Sukta. And there are famous verses from Purusha Sukta where it is said that Purusha has four parts and uh, his uh, mouth became Brahmanas, his hands and the shoulders became Kshatriyas, Rajanyas, the kings, his uh, thighs became 
the vicious, the productive, the enjoyment, and his legs became Shudra, the service. So this universal Purusha uh, is projected into the society, into the four major Varnas. Um, Shabindu describes these divine Varnas, uh, and we can see their resemblance of four Mahashaktis. Thus, we have first the symbolic idea of the four orders expressing to employ an abstractly figurative language which the Vedic thinkers would not have used, nor perhaps understood, but which helps best our modern understanding. The divine as knowledge in man, the divine as power, the divine as production, enjoyment and mutuality, the divine as service, obedience and work. These divisions answer the four, to four cosmic principles, the wisdom that conceives the order and principle of things, the power uh, that sanctions, upholds and enforces it, uh, the harmony that creates the arrangement of its parts and the work that carries out uh, what the rest direct. So we have this kind of narrowing down from the vision towards implementation, towards exchange, and finally uh, to do the rest, to embody it into the matter. So this kind of uh, actually concludes the whole cycle of development. So that's why we start with Satya Yuga and end with Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga is then narrowing down the higher, bigger streams into the individual framework. So everything which was there in Satya Yuga has to be uh, finally embodied in each individual. This is actually the answer to that, what we want to answer. What is this subjective age? Subjective age is this that uh, reveals the truth of the uh, yuga or of the manvantara at the end, as uh, in each individual will embody the, the same qualities. Shabindu gives more elaborate description here so uh, the ancient Chaturvarnya must not be judged, he says. So the ancient idea, Indian idea, was that the man falls by his nature into four types. There are first and highest, the man of learning and thought and knowledge. Next, the man of power and action, ruler, warrior, leader, administrator, uh, politician in, in the modern language. Third is uh, in the scale is the economic man, producer, the wealth getter, the merchant, artisan, cultivator. These were twice born, these three were twice born, who received uh, the initiation, Brahmin, Kshatriya and Vaish. And the last came the more undeveloped type, not yet fit for these steps of scale, unintellectual, without force, incapable of creation or intelligent production, the man fit only for unskilled labor and uh, manual service, the Shudra, one who has to support all those activities of the higher Varnas. So here we see this kind of ordinary look and if we see that all these varnas are met in every society we cannot a society cannot exist without teachers without uh, military or the royalties without the traders and without the servants uh, and all these major powers are embodying the four major mahashaktis yes, which are necessary for manifestation of the divine now, uh, stages in the human cycle, um, Shobindo describes uh, very beautifully. I just make make a quotation here. Um, the first, the symbolic stage of this evolution is predominantly religious, 
and spiritual. The other elements, psychological, ethical, economic, physical, are there, but subordinated to the spiritual and religious idea. So everything is there, but it is not standing, kind of uh, standing out. It is uh, subordinated to the major idea of spiritual and predominantly religious and spiritual um, worldview. The second stage, which we may call the typal, is predominantly psychological and ethical. All else, even the spiritual and religious, is subordinate to the psychological idea and to the ethical idea which expresses it. Religion becomes then a mystic sanction for the ethical motive and discipline, the dharma. This is the, the stage in, in which we develop the idea of dharma that becomes its chief social utility. And for the rest, it takes more and more otherworldly turn so that spirituality becomes some kind of beyond transcendental the idea of the direct expression of the divine being or cosmic principle in man ceases to dominate or to be the leader and in the forefront it recedes stands in the background and finally disappears from the practice and in the end even from the theory of life so it disappears, we see it, how it disappeared in our time. This typal stage creates the great social ideals which remain impressed upon the human mind even when the stage itself is passed. For the typal passes naturally into the conventional stage. The conventional stage of human society is born when the external supports the outward expressions of the spirit or the ideal become more important than the ideal. The body or even the clothes more important than the person. The presentation becomes more the important than the truth behind it. The tendency of the conventional age of society is to fix, to arrange firmly, to formalize, to erect a system of rigid grades and hierarchies, to stereotype religion, to bind education and training to a traditional and unchangeable form, to mechanize everything, to make it mechanical, to subject thought to infallible authorities, to cast a stamp of finality on what seems to it the finished life of man. So to create a model of a framework within each which everything works, the law. Now transition from the individualistic to subjective age. So this all results in the individualistic age. And so individualistic age is narrowing down to, and it starts with the uh, um, with the renaissance in europe as we know it it starts a little earlier with the greeks coming uh, to the picture of the development with their socrates uh, with mental structure we will come to it in the gypsarian description so individualistic age is then a radical attempt on mankind to discover the truth and law both of individual being and of the world to which the individual belongs a revolutionary reconstruction of religion philosophy science art and society is the last inevitable outcome it proceeds at first by the light of the individual mind and reason but it must go from the individual to uni the universal for the effort of the individual soon shows him 
that he cannot securely discover the truth and law of his own being without discovering some universal law and truth to which he can relate. He can relate it. In modern times, it has taken the form of a clear and potential physical, oh, sorry, potent physical science. But after a time, it must become apparent that the knowledge of the physical world is not the whole knowledge. It must appear that man is a mental as well as the physical and vital being, and even much more essentially mental than physical or vital. Man, yeah, mental being, it's quite interesting. Manushya from man, manas, mind. Even though his psychology is strongly affected and limited by the physical being and environment, it is not at its roots determined by them. His economic state and social institutions are themselves governed by his psychological demand on the possibilities, circumstances, tendencies created by the relation between the mind and soul of humanity and its life and body. So it's amazing. So our psychological, so to say, demand is governing our own institution and creates our own societies. As Shubhendu beautifully says in, in Savitri, and what the soul envisions is made the world. The world is made from one soul wants, from this intention. This has to be still discovered. Therefore, to find the truth of things and the law of his being, he must go deeper and fathom the subjective secret of himself and things, as well as their objective forms and surroundings. This he may attempt to do for a time by the power of the critical and analytic reason, but has already carried him so far, which has already carried him so far, but not for very long. There will be a shift. This would not be sufficient anymore, the critical and analytic reason. So the coming of subjective age, I call this slide, it is uh, citing from this chapter, the need of a deeper knowledge must then turn him to the discovery of new powers and means within himself. He finds that he can only know himself entirely by becoming actively self-conscious and not merely self-critical as it is in the individualist age or the age of reason. By more and more living in his soul and acting out of it rather than floundering on surfaces. In this process, the rationalistic ideal begins to subject itself to the ideal of intuitional knowledge and a deeper self-awareness. All these tendencies, though in a crude, initial and ill-developed form, are manifest now in the world and are growing from day to day with a significant rapidity. It's already happening. Meanwhile, the nascent subjectivism, preparative, preparative of uh, the new age has shown itself not so much in the relation of individuals or in the dominant ideas and tendencies of social development, which are still largely rationalistic and materialistic and only vaguely touched by the deeper subjective tendencies, but in the new collective self-consciousness of man, in that organic mass of his life, which he has most firmly developed in the past, the nation. This is the answer 
to this rising of the nations in the present uh, stage of humanity. Um, because he is, this uh, new subjective age will show itself up, first of all, in the formation of nations, not so much in the individuals, not so much in the dominant ideas and tendencies of social development. They will still belong to the previous stage of development, of the individualistic stage, of the uh, what we call the stage of um, uh, industrial uh, revolution stage, yes, where uh, man became free finally with uh, French and American and French revolution and uh, the democracy development. This is all the individualist development, but, uh, but the formation of nations is taking place now. And this is the first form of the, which shows that subjective age is arriving or arising. So it is here that it has already begun to produce powerful results, whether as a vitalistic or as a psychical subjectivism. So he separates these two. We will speak about them uh, as the false and true subjectivism, vitalistic or as a psychical subjectivism. And it is here that he shall see most clearly what is its actual drift, its deficiencies, its dangers, as well as the true purpose and conditions of a subjective age of humanity and the goal towards which the social cycle entering this phase is intended to arrive in its wide revolution. So this revolution is an interesting word because it will revolve everything. It will turn everything upside down. And that which was at the beginning will be at the end again in a new individual form. This is all about the coming of the subjective age. Now I have some other uh, details from Indian tradition and from Gapsa, and I will just fly through them. And then we will open uh, uh, for the discussion, which will be much more interesting in a way. Gita. Uh, Gita is amazing in one particular regard, because Gita it was the beginning of the Kali Yuga. So it is in the Kali Yuga that the system of four varnas is falling apart, as we read from the first chapter of the Gita. For it is time for the subjective approach towards the truth, leaving behind all conventions. And that's what uh, Arjuna asks uh, the uh, Sri Krishna. So why do you mix all the jatis? Because now we will not know who is who born in which family, because that system of Varnik was sustained by the birth Yes, so when you're born in the family of Brahmins, you're Brahmin in the family of uh, Kshatriyas, you're Kshatriya. So that was the indication of the true birth. But now if the Varnas are mixed, how would you know who is who? How would we know socially in the structure? We can't know. And Sri Krishna answering to Arjuna, he says that it is now in, in the heart of every individual that the man will find me the supreme in his heart or her heart, indicating the beginning of the individualist and subject, subjective age. <coughs> even if one is ill behaved, but found love in his heart for me, says Krishna, he should be considered sadhu for he made a right choice. Now, even those of a lower origin, such as women, that time they were considered to be of a lower origin, Vaishyas and Shudras can reach the Supreme by finding refuge in me in their hearts. What to say about Brahmins and royal rishis who are pure? So 
in the whole system, there is an opportunity to discover the truth in the heart of every individual. So this is a very good indication of the beginning of the movement towards individualistic and subjective age. We have very interesting uh, kind of archetypal thinking within the Mandukya Upanishad. Um, so Jabrata Svapna Prajna Anturiya, which I will relate to the Gepsarian studies. So there was a, a very famous Jean Gepser who, who was the social philosopher and psychologist and who studied the a human society and also he was very fond of art he was the friend of picasso he was thinking about the uh, four-dimensional art in the future by the way it's a very good topic for our art studies so he um, wrote his uh, major work which is called the ever-present origin uh, in, in at the end of 30s and then later in his life, he discovered the Sri Aurobindo. And when he discovered Sri Aurobindo, he wrote in his letter that uh, he, all his ideas in his major work were um, influenced by Sri Aurobindo's force. And this is quite interesting, so because it's very rare that someone would say such a thing. And then later in 1956, he also visited the ashram. He stayed in the ashram for one and a half or two years. And he saw the mother and he said that the mother represents what he calls the integral structure of consciousness. So now about his system, it's very similar archetypically to what we discussed already about yugas mm -hmm. and Sri Aurobindo's ages. So he looks at it in this way. So the beginning was the archaic structure of consciousness, the primal man, um, the Purusha of the Rig Veda, yes? the Adam Kadman of the Kabbalah or Osiris of the Egyptian, Gnosticism. And uh, in this archaic, the outer and inner are one and the same. There is no distinction between the inner and outer consciousness. So to say them, consciousness and power are one and the same. It's some kind of the beginning of creation, as it were. So where Adam and Eve are living in the paradise, let us say, so when they live in paradise, they don't make distinction between themselves. They don't see the difference between Adam and Eve. They are both the same. They, they are not ashamed of their differences. But uh, when they, are, um, they tried the apple of, uh, of life and uh, Eve kind of seduced Adam to try that apple, so they started to distinguish and see the difference. And so they were banished from the paradise to the earth, where in blood and sweat they had to earn their bread. And in um, this was the curse. And they, that is the next stage of the magic structure, let us say. Here the primal man becomes the maker, vital impulse, the instinct thus uh, unfold and develop a consciousness in dealing with nature. Witchcraft, sorcery, total, taboo are the natural means of freeing himself from nature. So it's approximately 10,000 BC according to, uh, to Gapsa. So when uh, these uh, Adam and Eve were kind of speaking symbolically banished from uh, paradise, they met the another nature, another kind of um, environment in which they lived and with which they identified themselves totally because they are used to this identification. And they it's kind of one dimensional reality, as, as Gebser would say. So there is no yet difference within the inner and outer. It is it is still 
unclear. It is there already, but it is unclear. That's why the witchcraft and sorcery and uh, curses, because the person who lives in this structure of consciousness believes that the nature is the extension of his own body, that he is the body of nature, that difference is not yet made, that he is an individual. He is not yet an individual. So in the mythical structure, uh, by the way, he gives a very beautiful description of the uh, of the Aboriginal tribes who are going hunting, and before they are going hunting, they are making the antelope in the morning on the sand near the sea, and uh, the picture they dance around, then they put the arrow into the neck of the uh, drawn uh, antelope. Uh, they take the arrow as if the ray of the sun and put into the neck and then they go hunting. Once they hunt, they kill the antelope, they bring to this place, they kill in the same place in the neck with the arrow, they put on this picture and they dance again around and then they eat. For them, the ray, the antelope, the sun, the arrow, them are part of one system. That's why they do all this. It's important for them to kind of obey the oneness of nature. Uh, the magic structure is bringing into our uh, consciousness this perception of oneness of nature. The mythical is a big change and shift. The mythical brings the awareness of the inner life of the soul, the psychic being, as it were, the inner being. Uh, its history and its origin, the primal myth, where we are coming from. Suddenly, we have a mythology, a language, word. Word comes with mythical structure. And um, we start speaking that we came from elsewhere to this nature. We are not from here. We are from elsewhere and we have to return back to our origin. Uh, so it creates two dimensional structure, the duality. We are not from here. And you can see all the religions are following this. There are monks, monasteries, they prohibit life of the nature. They want us to return to Advaita Vedanta. We all have to come back to Mukti, the idea of, uh, of uh, liberation and return to the spirit. Yeah, the prodigal son returns. We have to come back to our origin, to our home. So our home is not here. We are here by mistake or by uh, some kind of chance. Yeah? So we have to return. This is the mythical structure. Then there is a um, new structure appears, which is called mental structure, according to Gapsa. It individualizes man and his previously valid world, emphasizing his singularity and making his ego possible, as it were. It introduces a perspectival perception of the world. It's approximately, you see, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16th century AD. By spatializing time perception, we see time as a movement of space. It represents life by conceptualizing it, distancing man from his own nature. What is happening here is quite interesting. Petrarca, for example, was first um, considered to be the first tourist in uh, Europe because he was traveling only for the sake of viewing things, yes? not for any other sake. So when Petrarca you know, went to uh, um, uh, to the Alps, to the uh, uh, tops of the Alps, uh, of the mountains, he overviewed the whole space around. And he saw that its space continues there far away and there far away in every direction. And he was so taken by it that he wrote a letter to God saying, God, I saw this beautiful nature and in that moment, I forgot about you. Forgive me, please, that I forgot about you by viewing nature. <laughs> so this kind of nature 
being actualized, being brought back to the consciousness as objectively existing is the beginning of this mental awareness or rational awareness of us as objective beings. Three-dimensional reality. There are more examples there. I, I have no time to dwell on them, but it gives you a sense of that before that, we perceived the world very differently, not objectively. It was a subjective perception, but now we view it objectively. We view ourselves objectively, how we look, uh, we, we take care of our appearance too much. Before it wasn't so, it wasn't so important. Yeah? We view our body, our anatomy, our biology, we study our brain, we look at it objectively, we look at ourselves as objective beings. And this is the, the most uh, significant contribution of mental structure. And it is very critical and destructive because it looks at everything as objective uh, existence. So as uh, Gepso says, it has to be very brief because it will destroy the world. And we see how it, this uh, uh, age of our rational age is destroying the world. Yeah, We are in the time of the great extinction of species. We destroy the whole world with our uh, industries, with our economies, with our global warming. This is all uh, the result of this mental structure. And finally, uh, and why it is needed, it is needed for one reason, as Gepsu says, to redirect the mythical structure, which was always past oriented towards the origin where we came, we have to return towards the future. It reorients our inner self towards the future. And so integral structure becomes possible. That subjective age becomes possible. So here I will stop with these overviews, most probably, because I want to keep some time for us. Uh, but one thing I want to say to come back to my beginning, and this is um, something important that at the beginning of each manvantara, at the beginning of each cycle of the development from Satya Yuga onwards to Kali Yuga, the Rigveda by set of Purva Rishaya of the first Rishis is brought forward for humanity. And it's amazing that when we study, when we study the Rigveda, we notice that the Rigveda does not fit into any of these structures. It has all of them, as it were. It has magic, it has mythical, it has mental, very highly sophisticated language and poetic language. It has all of the structures kind of harmonized. And I was thinking, how is that even possible? It should be um, some kind of symbolic age which we doesn't have that integral structure, but it seems that integrality is brought from the previous cycle. So integrality, which we achieve at the end in this objective age becomes the beginning of a new Satya Yuga. And let us look at this last hymn, which is uh, the message of the Rigveda to the humanity. And you will see all these elements, all the structures, within one hymn, within few lines. And it sounds like this, sam gajjhatvam, sam vadadvam, sam vomanam si janatam, deva bhagam yatha purve sanjana na upasate. Go together, speak together, realize your thoughts together. As the first gods, the first gods assumed their share in this creation, sat fully agreeing with each other together. Samano mantrak samitih samani samanam manak sahachittam esham samanam mantram abhimantra yevach samanena voha vishaju homi. Uniting is their word, uniting is their gathering, uniting is their mind. Notice. 
word mythical structure, gathering the magic structure, mind, the mental structure, uniting, uniting, uniting of these gods who have one consciousness. It is this uniting word that I speak to you now. It is this uniting offering of yours that I offer. Sama niva akuti, samana hridaya niva, samana mastubo mano yathava susahasati. May your will in the body be uniting. May your aspirations in the hearts be uniting. And may your minds be uniting as in your common well being together. These are the last words of the Rigveda. And you can see will, heart and mind have to be united as in our common well-being together. So here I will stop and open to the questions if there are any. And uh, just raise your hand if you have any uh, comments or, or questions. Um, there are just a couple uh, co uh, comments uh, in the Q&A, uh, Vladimir, by a person anonymous. Um, I have fairly long. Don't know if you want to read them out and comment or if you'd like me to read them out, but it's more of comments than uh, questions. Yeah, comments are good also, yeah. Would you like to um, read them out for the audience? Uh, yes, uh, yes, all right. It may be interesting to know that quite a few developmental psychologists are exactly the same terms as Sri for the stages, from early childhood through the teen years. The very young child is described as living in a magic, symbolic consciousness. Our schooling tends to Wretch the children, the child, from that into the concrete conventional stage. Very true, very good observation. The child thinks in concrete black and white concepts, moving towards adolescence. There is a struggle between the pressure from society to fit into various conventional roles and the inner urge to become a true individual. So nicely said. In the um, early decades, developmental psychology saw the rational, mature individual as the final stage. In the last several decades, many developmental psychologists have proposed further stages leading to a unitive non-dualistic stage of universal oneness. And quick additional note from the same person, some developmental psychologists familiar with GAPSA suggest that infancy through the years of the toddler uh, can be seen as uh, reflections of the archaic magic mythical structures of consciousness. Yeah, I agree. By the way, archaic is actually uh, is integral structure, yeah? and it is integral, but without um, discernment of uh, elements within it. But uh, e e integral structure at the end is return to the archaic with the discernments of the elements. And that is the so that's why uh, Gebser calls his work the ever present origin because that origin of oneness of the inner and outer is constantly present, present through all the structures, yes, until it is totally revealed in the, in the integral structure. Um, thank you uh, for a very profound presentation question. How is the present subjective age a coming of Satya Yuga? <laughs> Well, it's a transition. Yeah? We have to, to, to finish the previous stage, and that previous stage will be finished when that Satya Yuga of the beginning will shine through in every individual. That would be the case. Yeah? 
And that will uh, prepare the ground for the next Satya Yoga, for the next involvement. Usually between Manvantaras, there is a pralaya period. Um, and in this pralaya period, the group soul withdraws from the embodiment, according to Indian tradition, and goes into that psychic world of the group soul, where it looks at the whole cycle of development, makes a new plan, a new vision, a new Veda, as it were, and comes back with a new plan of working, working out those elements which could not be worked out in the previous Manvantara. And this is the Veda, the vision of humanity, which is given to the humanity. And from there, we start again a journey, narrowing down to each individual. And then again, we withdraw, and again, we uh, reflect upon it, recapture it in a new manner, make a new plan as a group soul, and come down again back to a new man mantra. But Mother says between these uh, Vaivasvata Man Mantara in which we are now, and the next one, there will be no pralaya. Mm. There will be a transition, smooth transition. And most probably this is the subjective age, <laughs> that smooth transition. Mm. Okay, uh, I hope it, it answers uh, to a certain extent the question. And she, uh, uh, Vladimir Jayashree, the third question down there, she just adds a, another question to her. Is the Satya Yuga similar to the supermental world? Uh, maybe not immediately supramental, but towards it, yes. There will be overmental creation first, yes, as Shirobindo says. There will be overman, you know, there is the whole, uh, the whole topic was uh, depicted by uh, Georges, who passed away recently, a few years back. Uh, he wrote many books on Sri Aurobindo, and so he has these uh, kind of, uh, the whole book dedicated to this transition from the human beings towards the uh, supramental beings. There will be uh, the man, uh, the mind of light has to possess the human mind first. It will create that transition of over mental creation. So just to clarify, is the harmonizing of all structures part of the integral structure? Yes. And a new cycle begins after the first four. So harmonizing, it's even more so. Uh, uh, Gapsor is using the term diaphaneity. He takes it from Greek language. Diaphaneity, transparency. So all the you know, contributors, all the structures become efficient contributors and not deficient anymore. Because uh, in the mental structure, in the critical, it does not permit any other structure to shine through. It criticizes them, it removes them. You know? So the same as it happened in Europe uh, with, uh, uh, with fight between the religion and science, yes, the Inquisition and science was, uh, you know, uh, banishing religion and nobody believes in religion, uh, scientists, they have totally different mind, though they go to church secretly. <laughs> and uh, so these structures are becoming efficient contributors in this transparent new um, uh, framework of the integral structure. In the integral, they are all finding their proper place. Magic structure uh, supports the oneness with nature. The mythical structure supports the true divine presence in nature. Notice how beautifully they are. Uh, and uh, mental structure is like a sharp razor uh, instrument which can distinguish all the elements and work upon them and put them in the right position to each other. So all these instruments are gathered finally in the integral structure and become efficient contributors. Um, very nicely explained from the human cycle. Have We have started this book with the ashram teachers, Amal Kirhan and Nirod uh, Baran, um, during um, 1970. Still, same question arises in my heart. 
are we moving towards subjective Asia, apparently looking at the world going through conflicts, recollecting the sweet memories of ashram teachers? Excellent talk. So uh, yes, and Shubindu speaks about this, by the way, in the, the very chapter we um, quoted. Of course, we did, could not read the whole chapter. He says that, um, truly speaking, from the conventional age, when we come to the individualist age, there is a, a kind of um, a temptation many times because individualistically we not yet developed totally there is always a temptation to fall back into the convention because convention was a safe ground which was not demanding from individual much which was not pushing him to progress it was giving him a right place, you belong here, you're secured. It was providing a security. And that security is lacking in the individualist and subjective age. And many weaker individuals want to fall back into the, into the truth of, uh, of old, yes, from before. And this happens, and we can see this in the world. Many of the systems try to come back to that feudal or that tsar or whatever emperor, emperor empires try to to like russian empire nowadays tries to enlarge itself come back to its own size fighting against ukraine taking the lands why because it's more convenient to be in that conventional that uh, prehistoric age than to develop individually when individuals are not developed they have a tendency for the security of the conventional age. There's one more question. How do we equip ourselves so that we don't stop short on our journey to the subjective age? We are already moving all. We have to only discover a deeper self in us, not to be stuck with our desires and preferences and, uh, uh, and vital, you know, uh needs uh what is uh, nowadays promoted so much so that uh, comforts and money and desires have to be fulfilled as it were so it is not our aim it is our means but our aim is to discover deeper truth within ourselves and if we are not totally satisfied with only outer means then we are looking for a deeper answer, for a deeper connection. Great talk explaining the terms in a great way. I loved how the word Manushya explained as mental being. Yes, Shubindu speaks about this. Man, mind, Manushya, Manas, and vital. A vital being is more animal in us, yeah? Shubindu calls the human beings half beast, half god. <laughs> we inherited the animal nature, all this body physical and vital, but we have also acquired a new quality of the mental being. Mental being gives us a free will. We can choose how to evolve and develop. And that is also very dangerous because we may choose wrong things. My question is, if you could please explain ongoing uh, deeper, is that a mental stage? Yes, about the mind. Mind was uh, acquired, according to the mother, was acquired recently by human beings. So to say, we, we, when we received this capacity of mental thinking, um, we also acquired a free will. And, um, and that free will we could use for our development, says the mother, but unfortunately, we traded it for the power, intermediary power of money and wealth. And that power of money and wealth started to regulate our free will. So this is mother's explanation, which is profound, but I'm not going deep into it now at the end of our talk. But uh, the mental capacity of, of uh, choosing the path, choosing the, um, your own 
a way of dealing with reality, even if it is harmful to you, yes, uh, is uh, um, a higher capacity of which is connected to the supermind already. Shabindo says, in order to understand how mind functions, we have to discover the supermind. And so we could see that mind is a, as a projection, as a projection of the supermind and its presence uh, in, in the midst of our animal nature. Animals do not have developed mind, yes, they have partially developed mind, uh, but not uh, conceptual mind, not the rational mind, not the rational conceptual thinking and word. Word is another major characteristic of the mind. In the Rigveda, Vamadeva says, Aham Manur Abhavam, I became Manu, the mental being, Suryash and Surya. And it's interesting that he mentions Manu and Surya in one line, because Manu is our matrix, mental matrix for all humanity, which actually defines us as human beings. And uh, on the other hand, he became Surya. Surya is the supermind. So the mind and the supermind are going together. And that is the great mystery which we will uncover in the future. So thank you for your nice questions. And uh, thanks, thanks, Vladimir. We also have Jayanti that's uh, joined us today um, on the panel. And Jayanti is going to be uh, joining us as part of this eight part series and speaking on education in the subjective age. So just wanted to welcome welcome you, Jayanti, and uh, just to give you an opportunity to, to share anything that you would like or, or any comments before we end here. And, and you are muted, so you would have to unmute yourself. Unmute, no? Okay, no. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, we look forward to your talk and thank you for, for joining. Throughout this, we have invited all the speakers to join us as panelists so that they can follow along and, and also kind of keep the, the train as to what's been, been said and to comment and add wherever they would like. So we're just uh, really pleased that you're able to, to join us, Jayanti. And just a reminder that next week we have uh, Dr. Sum, Sum, Sumitra Basu who will join us and also emphasizing this transition as uh, Vladimir touched on between the individualistic age and the subjective age. So we hope you all can join us um, and uh, we will see you next week. And thank you, Vladimir, for a wonderful, uh, wonderful webinar. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.